The purpose of this podcast is to define some basic epidemiologic concepts and the study designs that you will most often come across and need to understand as you read clinical research studies. By the end of this podcast, you should understand two major study designs, the cohort study and the case control study, why a case control study can be thought of as nested within a cohort study, why the case control design is useful, why the commonly used descriptions prospective and retrospective are better avoided. As this podcast progresses, we expect you to have a basic understanding of the difference between incidence and prevalence and the difference between a cross-sectional study and a longitudinal study. For the sake of time, we will not discuss these definitions now. If you are unsure of these terms, please review the short podcast available on the same web page you found this podcast. What usually interests us in medical research is some version of the question, does factor X cause condition Y? X could be a drug, an environmental factor, an exposure to some kind of agent, a diagnostic test, an exercise program, whatever. Y could be the development of a disease, the cure of a disease, the prevention of a condition, the diagnosis of some disease, etc. Cause is therefore a loose term that stands for X having some effect on Y. In all cases, to answer the question, one needs persons both with and without X and with and without Y. If we have only a group of people with disease Y, for example, we can find out how many have factor X, but we cannot know whether X caused Y. Why? Because it could be that factor X exists in the general population in the same proportion as in our subjects with disease Y, in which case it would be unlikely that X caused Y. To show that X causes Y, we would want to see that more persons with X develop Y, than do persons without X. So to determine causation, we need to have some kind of a comparison group. The way in which we define our study population, including our comparison group, is a matter of study design. Note that we will often refer to X as exposure, but that this can refer to an intervention, such as a drug or a procedure. Likewise, we will usually refer to Y as disease, but this can also refer to an outcome of some kind as well. Since we have two major factors, exposure and disease, we have two major study designs based on whether we find subjects for the study based on exposure or disease. When our study population, including our comparison group, is defined by exposure and non-exposure, and we then determine whether the subjects develop the disease over the follow-up time, the study is a cohort study. When the study population is defined by disease, that is, we find persons who have the disease and persons who don't have the disease, and we then determine the exposure for each subject, then the study is a case control study. Cohort studies come in two forms. When the exposure is assigned to a subject by the study investigators, it is a clinical trial. When the exposure or intervention is determined by the subject, or the subject's doctor, or the environment, or circumstance, but not the study investigators, then the study is just called a cohort study. In a cohort study, we start with a group of subjects who are almost always initially free of the disease or outcome that we are interested in. In this case, let's say that our outcome of interest is a GI bleed. This cohort is free of persons who have had a previous GI bleed. At the beginning of the study, we usually know whether the subjects are exposed or unexposed. In this example, perhaps we have a group of aspirin users, the exposure, and are comparing them to a group of non-aspirin users. We then follow the subjects over time and observe whether or not they develop a GI bleed. We can then determine whether subjects who use aspirin develop a GI bleed more often than subjects who do not use aspirin. We will talk about how we do this in a later podcast. For now, the important thing to note is that the study population is defined by exposure. That is, whether the subjects are exposed or unexposed, whether they use aspirin or not. Again, we are choosing our study population based on exposure status. Outcome, whether or not they develop a GI bleed, is assessed afterwards. This is the essence of a cohort study. Cohort studies come in two varieties. When the investigator assigns an exposure or intervention to each subject, in this case, whether or not the subject uses aspirin or not, the study is a controlled trial. In this design, subject preference, or any other factor related to the subject, 
plays no role in whether the subject is exposed or unexposed. It therefore simulates a laboratory study, where the investigator changes one variable while keeping all other variables constant, and then assesses the outcome. In an observational cohort study, which is usually just called a cohort study, the investigator only observes how exposure is distributed among the population. Exposure can therefore depend upon many factors, including subject preference, physician preference, underlying disease, age, sex, and many other variables. For example, a patient and her physician might consider the patient's age, a history of heart disease, her renal function, and her personal preference before deciding to start her on daily aspirin. All these could be related both to why she is starting aspirin and why she is at risk of a GI bleed. Factors like these may make a cohort study much more difficult to analyze than a controlled trial. Ideally, trials are not just controlled, but also randomized. Remember that under ideal circumstances, like in a laboratory experiment, we would like only the exposure or intervention to differ between the two groups we are studying. Here, we only want the use of aspirin to be different between the two groups. This way, we can tease out the effect of aspirin on GI bleeding without having to worry about all the other factors that could influence a patient to take aspirin. For instance, our two groups should have the same distributions of age, gender, and number of people with H. pylori infection, because all these can be related to developing a GI bleed. We could try to manually assign each subject to one of the two groups, trying to make sure that each of these other factors was equally distributed between the two groups. But there are two big problems with this. One, it's very time intensive. Two, what if some other factor that you haven't thought about is also important? Maybe this factor, say alcohol abuse, is actually causing the outcome rather than the intervention you are interested in. Randomization ensures that all these confounding factors, both measured and unmeasured, are distributed evenly between the two exposure groups. So rather than having to manually assign subjects to one of the two groups, we let chance take care of it for us. Obviously, the more people we randomize, the more likely it is that all these confounders will be equally distributed between the two groups. When small numbers of subjects are randomized, it is more likely that there will be differences between the two groups due to the vagaries of chance alone. We've learned that if the study groups are defined by exposure, then the study is a cohort study. If the groups are defined by disease or outcome status, the study is a case control study. We choose our study population based on disease and then go back and determine exposure. In our example, we would first choose subjects based on whether they had or did not have a GI bleed and then go back and determine whether or not they took aspirin. The best way to think of a case control study is as a sample that is nested within a cohort study. Here, we start with the same study population we've already seen in the cohort study. In the corresponding case control study, we first find all the subjects who had a GI bleed. These are the cases. If we then determine their exposure status, we'll find that the 10 on top have taken aspirin and the 5 on the bottom have not. However, we know that we need to have a comparison group of subjects who have not had a GI bleed to answer a cause and effect question. In a case control study, our comparison subjects are called controls. Here, we found the same number of controls, persons without a GI bleed, as cases. You can also see that the same numbers of cases and controls used aspirin. Therefore, aspirin must not have had any effect on the development of GI bleeding in this example. Often, the hardest part of a case control study is deciding who to select as controls. Because we want our control group to be similar to our case group, we want our controls to come from the same underlying population as the cases. So the best group to get our controls from is the same underlying group that we got our cases from. Here, that would be the same group that would have formed our cohort if we had done a cohort study. The preferred method of finding controls is to choose them randomly from the underlying cohort without regard to whether or not they ever develop disease. We'll see why this is best in the next podcast on effect measures. But the other and more common way to choose controls is to choose them from subjects without disease. This is shown here. Our controls in this case are selected from subjects in the underlying cohort who never developed a GI bleed. You might notice one problem with this. If we choose controls from only the non-diseased, either aspirin users or non-aspirin users are likely to be overrepresented. 
Here you can see that there is a higher proportion of non-aspirin users to aspirin users than in the original cohort, where they were equally represented. If we take a random sample from this group, who never developed a GI bleed, we are more likely to select non-aspirin using controls. This method of selecting controls, though very common, is less preferable than the first method. Put another way, the purpose of the control group in a case control study is to determine how exposure is distributed in the underlying population that gave rise to the cases. This is the exposure distribution we want to compare in cases and controls. Yet another way to say this is that controls should represent the whole underlying source population, not just the non-diseased. By now, you may have gotten the idea that a case control study can be more difficult to design and implement than a cohort study. So why would anyone bother to do a case control study in the first place? Why not only design cohort studies? What if, instead of having only 15 cases among 40 subjects, we had only 15 cases among this many subjects? Here, the disease is rare. In the case of a rare disease, like scleroderma or a glycogen storage disease, we would need to follow up a very large cohort of patients over a long period of time to see just a few cases of disease develop. This would be a very time-consuming and costly cohort study, both in terms of money and manpower. On the other hand, with a case control study, the investigator can first find a sufficient number of cases, then identify a much smaller number of randomly selected controls, and then compare exposures in this more limited group. This is likely to be much more efficient in terms of time, money, and manpower. Finally, a short comment on so-called retrospective and prospective studies. Traditionally, cohort studies are thought of as being prospective, and case control studies as retrospective. This is because cohort studies were traditionally followed over time, collecting data all the while, while case control studies were not. They required investigators to actually question cases and controls about their exposures. Because collecting data in this way was subject to recall bias, something we'll talk about in a future podcast, these studies' results were less trustworthy than those from cohort studies. Hence, prospective studies were thought to be better than retrospective studies. There's an important point here, though. The key is how data are collected. If the data are collected in real time, then the study is prospective. If one has to go back to try to collect data, it's retrospective. So if a case control study is done in a cohort of, for example, Medicare users, a group who've already had data about their treatments collected, and exposure is assessed using drug prescriptions for, say, aspirin, is the study retrospective or prospective? We would argue that this is a prospective study. The data, in this case prescriptions for aspirin, are collected in real time. The subjects did not have to think back to remember their drug use. The point to remember is that just because the study is a case control study, it is not necessarily a retrospective study. Data could have been collected prospectively. Because of this potential confusion, we prefer to avoid these terms altogether. We prefer to identify whether the study is a cohort or case control study, and then determine how data was collected. This way, readers can decide for themselves whether there is potential for bias in how the data was collected. So now let's do some examples. In your manila folders are three studies. Let's first look at the one by Solomon and colleagues, entitled Cardiovascular Outcomes in New Users of Coxibs and Nonsteroidal Anti-Inflammatory Drugs. As stated in the abstract, the purpose of this study was to examine in a large group of new users of coxibs and NSAIDs the rate of cardiovascular events, their time course, and whether baseline cardiovascular risk modified the rate ratios for future events. The purpose is restated again in the introduction, just before the method section, which is normally where we would find the study objectives. Identifying the study design in a study is usually straightforward. There is usually a statement early in the method section that identifies it. Here it is in the second paragraph and clearly identified by the subheading, Study Design. This is a cohort study. In this paper, the authors identified this fact in the abstract as well, under the method section there. However, not all papers will give such a straightforward statement of design, so it is wise to get into the habit of looking deeper to find what the authors actually did. In the very next sentence of this paper, the authors go on to say, In the primary analysis, these groups, that is, those who used either NSAIDs or coxibs, were compared with subjects who did not use one of these agents, but who did initiate use of unrelated agents for the treatment of hypothyroidism or glaucoma. 
This sentence makes it clear that they are identifying their sample group by exposure. The participants either used NSAIDs or COXIBs, the exposed groups, or they used some other unrelated drug, the unexposed group. By looking a little deeper like this, we also realize that there are, in a sense, two parallel studies going on here. One in which the exposure is NSAID use and the comparison is some other drug, and another in which the exposure is COXIB use and the comparison is some other drug. But NSAIDs are not being directly compared to COXIBs. Note that the authors of this study describe it as a longitudinal cohort study, but do not describe it as a prospective or a retrospective study. Which do you think it is? The authors are using a patient care database in which data has been collected in real time. The authors did not go back to the subjects and ask them about their past NSAID exposures. In this sense, this is clearly a prospective study. However, this database was not developed for research. No one sat down before the data was collected and tried to determine what information needed to be collected for the purpose of this study. And the authors are clearly standing at the end of this study and are looking back in time. So in this sense, this could be thought of as a retrospective study. However, we would argue that this is in fact a prospective study. But even better, we would urge you to avoid these terms completely and ignore them when reading a paper. It is much more informative and important to examine the details of the study to see what the authors have actually done and to try to find features of the design, whatever they are, that could bias the results. The second study we'll look at is teriparatide or alendronate in glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis by SAG and colleagues. The purpose of this study can once again be found in both the abstract and in the last paragraph of the introduction. It is to compare alendronate, a bisphosphonate used to treat osteoporosis, with teriparatide, an analog of PTH, for the treatment of osteoporosis associated with glucocorticoid use. As in the previous study, the design is located right at the beginning of the methods section. It says, in this randomized, double-blind clinical trial. Again, if we look a little deeper in the same paragraph, we'll find the study sample. In this case, exposure to alendronate or teriparatide. Note that in this cohort study, unlike in the first, subjects are assigned to exposure to one drug or the other. Finally, locate association of chronic inflammation, not its treatment, with increased lymphoma risk in rheumatoid arthritis by Beckland and colleagues. The purpose of this study is again stated in both the abstract and in the last paragraph of the introduction. The authors note that RA is associated with an elevated risk of malignant lymphoma and that the goal was to investigate which patients are at highest risk of malignant lymphoma, and specifically whether this risk is driven by the level of inflammatory activity. The study design is identified in the abstract. This is a matched case control study. We're going to ignore the matching for now and simply observe that it is identified as a case control study. Note that this time, the authors did not explicitly state that this is a case control study in the methods section. However, they do in the last paragraph of the introduction, and it becomes evident as they describe the study. Note that in this paper, the authors first identify the underlying cohort of subjects that they have chosen the cases and controls from. A group of patients identified from a Swedish national inpatient register, all diagnosed with RA. So they've told us exactly what the underlying cohort is from which they're going to select cases and controls. They then go on to describe cases as all patients from this cohort who were diagnosed with lymphoma as identified in a linked database of Swedish cancer patients. Note that the cases are clearly identified on the basis of their disease status. For each case, the authors then randomly selected a control from the same RA cohort describing how controls were matched to cases. Again, no mention is made of exposure in selecting controls. So even if they had not been explicit in identifying the study design, the authors are clearly describing a case control study. In this podcast, we've discussed a number of important concepts. We've discussed the two major study designs, the cohort study and the case control study. We've observed that a controlled clinical trial is simply a form of cohort study. We've also discussed how case control studies can be thought of as being nested within an underlying cohort study. We also understand that case control studies are used because they are often more efficient than cohort studies. Finally, we discussed why the terms prospective and retrospective are somewhat arbitrary, potentially confusing, and better avoided. This concludes this podcast.